Hello and welcome. Today we are discussing the uh, Sabbath School Lesson 3, Cosmic Messages, and we are on Lesson 4, Fear God and Give Glory to Him. So welcome to all of you. Um, before we begin, we'd like to give an opportunity for testimony, and Janet has one that she is burning to share with us. So go right ahead, Janet. Hello, everyone. I am so thankful for all the prayers that everyone has been um, extending on behalf of my family. Um, I've asked you guys to pray for my son who had relocated to a new city. And he called earlier in the week and says, Mom, I'm having such a great day. I had an opportunity to meet someone who's a professional in the area that um, I'm similar professionals. And it's so good to have someone that I can establish a relationship with um, personally and professionally, who is very similar to me in my personality and things of that sort. So I thank God so much for that, because that has been a burden on my heart as a parent. When you have a young adult who moves into a new city, you want to make sure that they make um, good connections. And so I give God thank you for that. And then I also want to share that God cares about us even in the little, little things. I know we say that a lot, but um, about two weeks ago, I lost my watch. And for me, my watch is my timekeeper because I'm not one who takes out my phone to look at the time. I, I just I'm not accustomed to doing that because I've been wearing a watch for years. And I was really saddened by it because one, my watch is important to me for timekeeping, but then two, it was a watch that my husband had given me as one of our anniversaries. Mm -hmm. And I felt really bad about having to have lost it. But the more I thought about it, I said, you know what, Lord, I'm not gonna worry about it. People have insurance for reasons. If we need to replace it or something like that, we can always go about doing that. And so I just prayed and let it go. Today, my watch showed up unexpectedly. And I was Lord. like, wow, Lord, it's been two weeks. I prayed and let it go. And you actually had it show up. And I gave him thanks for it. I was doing a little happy dance. Very thankful that he cares about the small things. So, yeah. Amen. 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 Thank you. And he cares about each of our small things. So Amen. he's good. You yes, know, I... Is. I can fathom, you know, loving someone well, maybe, maybe one or two people, but I mean, God, he finds a way to uh, extend that to all of us. Thank you. So do at uh, this time, if you would like to share any other praises or prayer requests um, that you'd like us to bring before the Lord. I'd love to share a praise um, to end a praise that um, I prayed in like the morning for my mom um, to help her with something she was struggling with. And then later that same evening, she said that God helped her and she saw it and she was able to get through what she was struggling with. And I just praise God for that, that it happened within like the same day for her to have help like that. Um, and yeah, I praise God for that. Amen. You know, I, I want to praise God too. Um, uh, this week I had some very close friends, um, that called me somewhat out of the blue. Um, and were just sharing with me that they were, um, having a really difficult time in communication with their spouse and that they were just struggling. You know, one party was ready to give up and the other was um, not sure how to deal with the situation. And, you know, we prayed together and we talked about things and they talked with they about things and I praise the Lord that they had good communication and that they are continuing to work it out. And the Lord is working um, to heal hurt and um, just to show himself in their, in their marriage. So I praise Amen. God. For that. Amen. 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 All right. Well, let's go ahead and pray then. Naomi, would you mind praying for us? Yes. Um, dear Jesus, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much 
for bringing us all here to um, study your word and a look at your inspired word. And I praise you for um, helping us through this these days and these prayer requests and also the testimonies and praises. Um, I am praying over this time that you please bless it. Please give us wisdom and guidance and I pray all of this that your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. So as we take a look today, let's see what we have in fear God and give glory to him. All right. So a lesson today is has touched my heart in that um, I believe that when we praise God in the small things and even as we usually do most of us in the big things it puts us in a different mindset and the lesson this week was talking about fearing God and giving glory to him the memory verse uh, came from Revelation 14 12 where it says here is the patient of the saints here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ and as we're contemplating what that means in the book of Revelation as we've been studying it it is there to prepare us for the second coming of Jesus. And so let's look at Revelation 14, 7 to determine what John's direction is to us as we prepare for this end time. Revelation 14, 7. What instruction is he giving us here? I have it. Okay. Revelation 14, verse 7. Mm -hmm. He's saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who had made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water. So when you hear the terminology fear and we are looking at it from a perspective of humans, what mm -hmm. does fear, the word as it is given here, what can it incite within us as a definition of fear? I mean, I think... The first thing I think of is you're afraid of something that's scary or something that's bad, something that can hurt you. Um, that's, I think, the most common use of the word fear in my mind. Okay. Anybody else? Um, like be careful or cautious. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing how one word can have so many different definitions, right? Yeah. So and you go ahead, Lindsay. I was just going to say, you know, one of the largest fears in my, that I've heard is a fear of um, speaking in front of people, which ah, I think is interesting because we're not afraid to speak in front of people because we think they're going to hurt us, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, we're naturally scared to speak in front of people because we don't want to do a bad job. I mean, I think we all, if we knew we were going to do a great job, we were going to say just the right thing, or we were going to sing perfectly every word on, on key, then I don't think we would be scared to speak in front of people. But I think there's that fear, like, I'm going to say something, I'm going to look stupid, or they're going to think that I look ridiculous or whatever the case may be. Um, but I think that's also in that same category of um, caring so much what they think, but not necessarily of what they'll do to us. That's interesting. So can I have someone to, uh, turn to Luke 12, 5? Luke 12, 5. And... Let's see what it says here in regards to the word fear. I have it. Okay. It says, but I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who after he is killed has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. So if someone told you that you were going to be hurt really bad, would that cause you to have fear? Yeah. And it's a different, is it is the kind of fear that you were describing, Lindsay, a couple minutes ago in regards to standing in front of people and speaking? Is it that same kind of fear? Yeah. 
I mean, if I'm going to be hurt really badly, no, that's a different, that's a different fear. Okay. So now let's look at Revelation 19.5. I can read that. Okay. It says, And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. Interesting. Same word. Um, the lesson tells us that the Greek New Testament word for fear that's used in Revelation is phobio. What English word do we get that has that same connotation or same sound of a word? Phobia, which ah. is an unwarranted fear, right? Isn't it like an extreme fear? What are some what are some examples of phobias that people have today? Arachnophobia. Okay. Hydrophobia. You said what pyrophobia? Hydro. A hydrophobia. Yeah. I don't know what it's called, but the fear of heights and of darkness. Yeah. Claustrophobia. Um, claustrophobia is a good one, also. These are fears that we may know someone that has it, or we've heard of people that have it. And um, in the sense of the word fear, when people hear, may hear, who, people who are not Christians may hear us use the term fear God and give glory to him. Is there a possibility that they may be applying that definition to that word? Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. And yet yeah. we know that that's not the fear that this is talking about. Because the Bible tells us, in fact, I think we talked about it just just very recently, you know, that God gives us a power. He does not give us a power of fear, right. but a power and love and a strong mind. Mm -hmm. So we know that fear is not coming of God, not that fear. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. We so can, are, are there some examples in the Bible where we have heard of people being told to fear not? What are some examples that you can think of? When the angel came to Mary and told her that she was going to have a baby, or when the angel came to the shepherds on the mountain, you know, right. fear not, I bring you good tidings of great joy for all the people. Um, also in uh, Matthew 14, Jesus uh, told the disciples, do not be afraid, it is I, when he's walking on the water. Yes. My favorite one is Joshua, when the angel came to him and commanded him, and he told him on more than one occasion, fear not. Mm. And in that regard, the way that the words are used here, it is one that does not elicit the definition that we talked about, which is um, for the different phobias that are out there. It's more of a awe, respect, um, common soothing comforting to you to be in a place where you are the recipient of a message that's coming to you. So the same word, but with different definitions, uh, can we then turn to Psalms 89 verse seven? Now someone should read that for us. I have it. Psalms 89 verse 7. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. Amen. So this verse in Psalms is telling us to fear God, but it also tells us that he is we are to come to him in a reverent state of being awed by him. So is that a fear that is extended to one where we are supposed to be trembling or is there something else? I think um, there's something else. Like if I think of, I don't know, who's the most important person in the world. I, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say the president, um, but if you think of, 
the most okay um for lack of a better example you know you come to the queen when she was alive right you mm -hmm. come to the queen and you're not going to probably be meeting the queen and oh my phone rings i'm just gonna answer it because i got you know i don't i don't know who it is they might, yeah. might be able to get a hold of them later you're not going to be taking that call right or when the queen comes you're not going to say oh you know these shoes are real uncomfortable i'm just going to kick them off for a little bit you know let my feet get some air you know and it's not because you'll be arrested for it but you just you want to bring your very best attitude and behavior mm -hmm. you know if you're preparing to speak with a queen you're going to try and get sleep you're going to try and make sure that you don't have something in your teeth you know you just you want to be um your very best mm -hmm. and um, you think of uh moses right when god called moses he asked moses to take off his shoes Mm -hmm. um so mm. i think that was another thing and it's cultural like here in america we don't go into the sanctuary barefoot but when i lived in cambodia you would never wear your shoes in the church you always take your shoes out outside the church so some things are cultural but i think that the overarching point is that he's not anybody he's not you know I, I, like I mean, that. He's not just anybody. So I another a thing that came to mind, I'm sorry, Naomi. Okay. I wanted to just also say, it's like when you're trying to apply for a job and it's a job that you really, really want and have been waiting for for a really long time. I think it's like the same essence of like wanting to do everything well and wanting to study and prepare, but also keep your like manners and um respect and all of that as well so that he can pick you but um it's just that same like air that you have thank you lynn um naomi and another thing that came to my mind that refers to i like the example Lindsay gave about the queen think about going to a courthouse and standing before a judge Mm. what type of fear does that evoke and what type of behavior does that evoke also you know i think part of that is that you know that that judge has power mm -hmm. to decide your case right and we look at that verse i think it was the second verse you had us read where it talks about don't fear or almost you could almost replace it with don't worry about what the world is thinking about you like their opinion is really not relevant like mm -hmm. the the real the real one that you should be concerned with pleasing is the one that really has the power to make a decision not just for your case in this life but for your eternal case. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And I, I share. Like how, go ahead. And look upon it. I like how the um, lesson says that um, it conveys the thought of absolute loyalty to God and full surrender to His will. Um, you know, it is an attitude of an attitude of mind that is God centered rather than self centered, and God centered rather than self centered. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And I chose the example of the judge for the reason of when we think about fearing God, a judge, as Lindsay pointed out, has that positional authority and evokes a fear at the same time that is the trembling kind of fear. But then there's also a fear of reverence for the position that he holds. And so when we think about fearing God, that refers to respect, to have awe about him, to just wonder his infinite wisdom and his power, but yet to have a sense of love that comes from him because of who he is. So in fearing God, then, it is a state of mind where we choose to be 
loyal to God, to be in a place where we choose to extend the adoration and praise that belongs to him. So look at with me, um, when we talk about fearing God, um, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14 say, the conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments, because this applies to every person, for God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. So fearing God puts us in a place where we accept who he is and what he has done for us because of the fact that he loves us and we not deserving of that mercy is then in receipt of it. Um, has there been a time when you can think of where you've had to explain to somebody what it means to fear God? I think I've tried to explain it to my children. Um, I'm an imperfect parent, you know, I want, I want my children to be able to learn about how they relate to God through, you know, the experience they have with me. But of course, there are still times where, you know, they do what I say, because if they don't, they'll be in trouble. And I don't want them to be afraid in that way and yet i think that there's an important there's an important element in being a parent of having your children have a very similar fear for you mm -hmm. they love you they care about you and yet it's not just all snuggles and kisses like there's there's got to be a point where they don't know what will happen, but they know not to cross it. <laughs> and, and I, I think, I, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, I was going to say, I think that um, the appearance um, holds a place that no one else does um, in that they have a right to do things that other people don't. Or, you know, the discipline, the correction, the, um, and, and I mean, to actually take and mold these little lives, you know, and, um, the trust that God gives us. And so that so closely mirrors the process that, um, and I believe that's why the fifth commandment is so important because, you know, that honor that you have um, prepares you, like you said, to have that type of honor for God um, in that wonderful situation is a healthy, you know, thing. And you do that, it, it kind of sets that mold in your character to be able to you know, honor God. And so um, I just think that in, in doing that, a parent, uh, uh, like even for example, I'm, I'm a teacher. So there's, um, I might love that student and I might adore that student, but I'm limited because I'm not that child's parent. And so there are places that the parent can go that I can't go as a teacher. And so um, that's kind of how it is with God. He holds a place, not kind of, but it's how it is with him. He holds a place as our creator, as our redeemer, that nobody else will. He has rights um, to, to honor, to worship, to, you know, adoration in a, in a way that no one else ever will. And so it, put, it sets him aside in a place where he deserves that, not fear, but we understand that he hold, he, he's omnipotent, you know. Deserving. Yeah. Yeah, good point. So. Let's do a little parallel here. Can I get someone to look at Ecclesiastes 12, 14? And then someone else will turn to Revelation 14, 7. And we're going to read them and see what the parallel is between these two. That's Ecclesiastes have, 12, 14 and Revelation 14, 7. I have Revelation 14, 7. I still have Ecclesiastes. Uh, Okay, so let's read Ecclesiastes 12, 14 first. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. 
Okay, and then Revelation 14, 7. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. What, what parallel do you see between these two texts? Well, they're giving God, the reason why we fear God is because he made the heaven and earth. Um, and also in Ecclesiastes, it's referring to it as a, as a point in the future. Fear God, or for God will bring every act to judgment, whether everything is hidden or whether it is good or evil. And then in verse seven, it says, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. So these texts both are stating the context of a coming judgment. Mm -hmm. And when you have a judgment that is coming, that means that there's someone who is going to be sitting on or in that judgment seat, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with having the ability to be our judge, well, not the guilty, but he is the omnipotent one who is our judge. And in the prior text on of um, Revelation, we were told to give honor and glory to God. Is there a connection with having a uh, fear for God as our judge, but yet given to him the honor and glory that's due to him? Can you ask the question again? The connection is there a connection between having a fear of God as our judge, but yet giving him honor and glory because it's due to him. So should we be in a place where we are able to do both? And if so, why? Yes, because he's both. He's judge and he's creator. You know, um, just like your parents. Maybe not now, but they were responsible for you and they brought you into this world as well. Ah, like my children used to say to me, I didn't ask to be born. I thought you were going to say, I brought you into this world and I can take you out. <laughs> that's what I would threaten them with, but that's not what they would say. They would say, I did not ask to be born. That was their way of, of reminding me that. A choice that I made created them. And so I needed to extend grace to them. And in a way, let's talk about the grace that God extends to us. Can we turn to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9? I have that. Okay. Ephesians 2. Verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Ooh. Grace. Grace does not free us from obeying the commands of God but it sets us free from the condemnation of the law. So in the text where you just read, it was nothing that we did or could do. It's extended to us. Mm -hmm. So if grace is not only delivering us from the guilt of our past, what then is grace, what additionally is grace given us? So it delivers us, what else does it do for us? It gives us the power to obey his, uh, his commands. Because without him, I mean, think of it. If we, if we were to take all the commandments and he says, you know, the summary of the commandments is love God, love your neighbors. We can't do that because on our own, we will always put ourselves first. We can't even really love without him. And so mm -hmm. we can't 
we can't obey these commandments either, even if on the surface it looks like we are. Um, it reminds me of the memory verse this week um, with the students in our class where um, he get, he's given us the will, to will and to do, uh, Philippians 2 and 13, that we are not able in ourselves even to have a desire to repent without God, without the Holy Spirit's help. And so um, it really is his grace that helps us to um, even want to, when he just gives us the will to do it. So. so grace not only delivers us from the guilt of our past and gives us freedom, but it also empowers us in that freedom to live godly, obedient lives as Christians. So how many of you have heard people say, well, grace gives me freedom so I can do whatever I want? You ever heard people say that? The gist of it, yeah. Yeah. So that, that idea that salvation by grace somehow negates the law of God or minimizes the necessity for us to be obedient to God puts them in a place where they're making a decision of their own and by their own works then they are attempting to be saved. But that's not what the Bible calls us to do. Now Romans 1.5 tells us that we have received grace and apostleship from obedience to the faith among all nations. So the question then is, if someone looks at the um, text in Revelation 4, where it says, fear God, I'm sorry, in Revelation 14, where it tells us to fear God and give glory to him because the hour of his judgment has come, when they are contemplating their lives from a standpoint of being saved or not being saved, and they're saying, well, God is going to forgive me or allow me to do X, Y, and Z because of his grace, how then should we share with them what this text is trying to tell us about fearing God and giving glory to him? I think it has to do with our focus um, and like a roundabout kind of way, because I think sometimes we don't think of sinning and transgressing God's law as awful as it is. We just think of it as this is just what I naturally do, or this is just what I, what I like, you know, but if we think of it as something as horrible as to pull God out of heaven to save us from it, you mm. know, yes. You think of the way that sin has caused all the pain that it has here in this world then i don't think it's something that we really want to cling to mm. um if there's a controversy like why would we want to you know carry around the swastika if we're not on that side of the the army you know like we we wouldn't want to hold on to those things um and I think the more that we study and we learn of who God is mm -hmm. and how great he is, or even sometimes, you know, sometimes just if you're outside and you look at the stars and you see how big the sky is and how many stars there are and you realize, you know, God made all of this, you're just left with awe. And it seems like maybe the things that we want to hold on to just don't seem as as uh, as treasured as maybe we had them before. Mm -hmm. um, and I like the way the lesson points out um, which Christ, you know, are they referring to? Because the Christ in scripture doesn't 
um, he says that if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Right. And, and you know, he who says he loves me and, and um, hates his brother is a liar. I mean, there the love that you say you have for him has to have the professed works that come along with it. You know, faith without works is dead. Show me your works and, you know, you can't see the faith without the works. And so um, it's, uh, it's, it's no, it's no different than if, um, you know, I go and uh, get a, a new job and I come and tell you, I got a new job, but if I never show up on Monday and then Tuesday and Wednesday, a month later, you know, I'm still saying I got a new job, but I never showed up for the job. You know, there should, you make the, a confession of your faith and your love for God. There has to be an action that follows it. Mm. So let's talk about the action and that work. Um, turn with me to Matthew 6, 1 and 2. Matthew 6, 1 and 2. It says, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. So, this idea of good works, how do we advise when it comes to talking about our good works needs to be of our mindset or of, um, bringing uh, glory to God? How do we reconcile this when people ask us about that? Because there's some people who think, hey, if I didn't done this, then God has to do this for me. I think um, what I think about is as we get to know God and um, as we get to know his word and we truly um, study and you know, get to know him, our works will naturally come to be of how Jesus was or the keeping his commandments because we know him, we trust him in that way. And it's as a result of doing those things, blessings come in that way, not necessarily because we did that to get those blessings, but because we're naturally wanting to um, love and respect God and keep his commandments in that way. I hope that makes sense. So if I, what I heard you said is it's not anything that a person does, but it's what God has done through them that allows his goodness to then show through so others can see and the praise then should be extended to him for what he's done. Yeah. You'll get that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Getting to know him, he works through us. Yes. Thanks, Naomi, for and, that. And I think also um, when, we, when we come to Christ and we give him what we have, we die to self, right? Mm -hmm. So the things that we're doing we don't do them for ourselves anymore. We're doing it for him. And as long as we are um, doing it for him, then we will be following the commandments, right? Because we'll be following his example um, mm -hmm. and we'll be doing everything for his glory. So um, there's, still, there's still times where we all, get distracted and uh we go back to our um you know pursuing our own our own path but as uh christians that are following him and have given him already all that we have then it just makes sense that we'd follow what he did and that that's a really good segue to having us then look at others in the Bible who have gone through that same um, walk, like Revelation, his final appeal to call us through faith in Jesus to accept the fullness of what he has to offer. 
faithful people who have been in a place where no matter what their circumstances is, they have given glory to God. Mm. Um, before we go to that, though, let's take a look at Romans 12, 1 and 2. I can read that. Okay. Um, and it says, I beseech ye, I'm sorry, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And I asked us to read that because I wanted, as we go into the examples of people who have given themselves to God, to realize that it's a total commitment, meaning that when they, when they, I said they, but when we decide to go into a place where we give ourselves uh, uh, to God, that it has to be 100%. And um through our commitment to do God's will in that regards and everything that we do, it then allows others who are looking on to see, hey, why is this person so different? What is it that gives them um, the ability or the desire to do what it is that they're doing? And then when we do that, it then goes back to who then gets the glory? Mm -hmm. It is God who then gets the glory out of that. So let's turn to Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. We talked about the overcomers. That is um, Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. I have it. Or some... okay. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So examples in your life where you are in, in other parts of the Bible where you have trusted God or Jesus, sorry, in this example of an overcomer to where you have overcome. Does anybody have any examples that they can share or they can think of? I was thinking about Joseph in the Bible, especially when you were talking about not conforming and um and no matter what circumstance totally wholly giving yourself to god and there's multiple times um when he was tempted by potiphar's wife and when he had um the chance before his brothers no one around him knew anything about his brothers no one knew anything they all might have but um as in no one knew so he had the chance but he didn't take it he decided to honor god and decided to um forgive in that sense um he gave his life holy in every circumstance so that's my example um Rosa? so the bible it it talks about the tongue being um an evil that um, that that uh, even the strongest of men can't control, right? And um, I remember in the past I had a hard time with um, my words. I had a, a sense of humor that was very uh, critical and um, sharp, and I remember. Um, looking and seeing um Zachariah right the story of Zachariah and how um he hadn't had faith and so God had um 
stopped his tongue and he couldn't, he couldn't speak mm -hmm. um, because of his lack of faith. And then also um, the words that God spoke to Moses when Moses said, you know, I'm slow of speech. I can't say that. That's, that's not in my skill set. Um, and so I was reminded that the Lord is the one that owns, owns the tongue and that he's the one that um, can give us power. He gives us the power to speak. He can give us the power also um, to hold our tongue at the right time. Amen. I was thinking of uh, Peter and his uh, peppered path. Um, even, you know, I think probably his lowest moment was when he, um, and I'm saying how he must have viewed and felt about it, was um, when he, you know, denied uh, Jesus um, and uh, how, you know, we know how he uh, overcame all those and was uh, eventually um, martyred for the Lord. And so he really was to me um, from cutting off the soldier's ear to rebuking Jesus to, you know, thinking we all think they were all, but he sank, but he did get out that boat. So um, I just think he was an overcomer in the end. He just really uh, allowed the character of Jesus to be formed in him. Well, Lavana, you said that my mind went to, do you think Peter thought that he was glorifying God in his actions? When he was doing them? Yeah. Not when he first took them, but um, in those other things, cutting off the ear and, you know, um, telling Jesus, God forbid, he's not going to lay his life down and all that. I'm pretty sure he thought he was on spot on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know. I don't know about you guys, but for me, sometimes when I think about characters in the Bible, I have to remind myself that they were human just like us and they experienced the same things we go through. Not all of their character flaws are shown in the Bible, but enough is there to allow us to think about the things that they've gone through. Mm -hmm. But yet they are highlighted in the Bible for us to see that they overcame. If someone can yeah. turn to Revelation 14, 12, Revelation 14, 12, it gives us hope when we think about Revelation in the last days about where we should be when it comes to fearing God and obeying him. Fearing God meaning to be in awe, respect, and reverence of him, Revelations 14, 12. Um, I'm there, I have it. Okay. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So Revelation 14, 12 tells us, or gives us a picture of God's faithful people in the last days. And I like where it says in the lesson that the only way anyone can keep commandments of God then and now is through the faith of Jesus. Mm. Amen. Amen. It didn't say faith in Jesus, because a lot of people go, oh, yeah, faith in Jesus. Well, a lot of people believe in Jesus and they use his name differently. But when you have the faith of Jesus, that is a keeping faith. Mm -hmm. One that allows us to go through the things that we do, but yet stay connected to God in a way that no matter what happens, we then glorify him because we know that he has a plan for us. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. amen. I also so, like I'm sorry, go ahead. I also like that it gives when we exercise the faith that the Holy Spirit puts in our hearts, that faith grows. And it gives me hope that my faith can grow as little as it sometimes seems to me that I just appreciated that little point about our faith, that it can grow, it can be strengthened as we exercise it. Um, what you guys are saying, I just want to, um, it's just ringing in my heart for Romans uh, 15 and 4 that says, um, for what's the Romans 15, 15 and 4? 15 and 4, yeah. Okay, we can turn there. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, 
that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what you're talking about, the hope. And, and when we look at Peter and the, their, their humanity that they walked in, you know, mm-hmm. and that they were overcomers and that we are uh, created to be overcomers, those so revelation overcomers, um, it can give us hope. Amen. Amen. And it's also to remind us when we are going through that Jesus here on earth went through suffering. He was chosen by God to come down to be like us so that we can see that through him, we can have eternal life. And that promise is so true so that when we get to the point where we start feeling um, discouraged because we think to ourselves, well, I can't, then we know that we can because of Jesus and his promise to um, never leave us nor forsake us. Um, Promise that is made to us that I'd like us to think about is John 14, one through three, one through three, if we can turn there. Did you say John 14? John 14, one through three. Okay, I'm there. So guess, uh, can you read that for us? Yes. Um, John 14, one through three. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whose whose words are these? Jesus. 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 And so because of the fact that he has made that promise to us, we can know that when he tells us, Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God, have the faith of, um, and remain faithful to Jesus. He's already been faithful and our example. So we just need to hold on to him to get to that point. The lesson tells us also that the word overcomer in one form or another is used 11 times in the book of Revelation. And I've heard um, some ministers say that if a word is used continuously, there's a reason and we need mm-hmm. to pay attention to that. Mm-hmm. Having the look of being an overcomer and looking back at the lives of others who have overcome, and then hearing Jesus say himself, he's overcome this world, and he's gone to prepare a place for us and he's coming back, should leave us with hope, knowing that soon and very soon, we can be with him because he promised to come back and get us. Mm-hmm. Amen. So... As we move forward into the upcoming week, we need to remember that um, it is faith in action that keeps us and should allow us to continue to have a believing, transforming life, to be an overcomer because God has promised it. And we don't have to do it on our own. Our faith comes because of Jesus and what he's promised to do for us. Amen. 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 Lord is good. Um, um, oh, I'm go sorry. <laughs> I was. I just wanted to share. Um, uh, Hebrews two and seventeen. Um, which text which is, is that? Let's turn to it. Two and seventeen. Hebrews. Hebrews two. Hebrews and two. Okay. Go ahead. Where it says, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. So he was made just like us. Like he didn't have an unfair advantage over us. The same power of God that lived through him, the Holy Spirit is able to live in us and we can have hope. He didn't, you know, he, he's a righteous and a good God. He didn't uh, come and have some type of unfair advantage that, that we can't do and keep the commandments the way that he did. Amen. 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 He wants to give us all that power. All right. Lavana, would you mind having closing prayer for us? 
No, I would love to have food. Dear Jesus, we just want to thank you. First of all, we thank you for the power that you have and that you do forgive sins. And we thank you that you've forgiven men. We ask you to forgive us, Lord. And thank you for letting us know that the power that you had is available to us and you overcame and, and we can be of good cheer that you called us to be overcomers, that we have that patience and, and we keep your commandments. And Lord, we just ask that this lesson that we have studied today, that it would resonate with us this Sabbath um, and that it would continue in our hearts that we would meditate on it. And it would add to us the character that you call for us to have, that we can allow the Holy Spirit to recreate your character in us. And we thank you for that, Lord. And we ask that you would uh, bless all those who are uh, listening and here and, and bless each and every one of us in your precious name we pray amen. amen amen thank you so much for each of you who joined us this evening and we pray that you're blessed this week god bless so next week next week's lesson we're doing the good news of the judgment so something for us to all look forward to amen. thank you very much all right good night